Started. So, welcome to, I guess, uh, review session uh, for the final. So this is the second one. The first one was more like a cheat sheet overview. Um, so what we're going to go over today is this guy, uh, which is Spring 2018's final. I, I did the entire thing just now, and it was it was a lot worse than I thought I remember it being, in the sense that like it doesn't seem like Terribly applicable this question. Um, so there's, there's a reason why I told everyone that uh, what you should do is do the other like professors' exams rather than the previous finals. Is because different professors have like different problems that they like to write. So for example, uh, probably have noticed that the other professors on midterm three really like the physics problems um, with the like spring stuff. It's not even spring stuff; it's just straight up physics stuff. So like that's that's like the type of thing like that will likely get focused on the exam. Like I have no idea what's on the exam, so I can only like guess at this point. So I mean like in previous semesters, right, you're not gonna have like such a focus on like the physics stuff. This exam was like a bunch of tricks and a bunch of like I, I don't I don't know. It, it, we'll take a look, but um, I mean there's some good stuff in here, there's some not very applicable stuff, but we'll take we'll flip through. Um, and see how it goes. So I don't know if this, this is going to take us the entire two and a half hours. Um, if it, uh, I don't really have that much to do on top of this, but um, we can figure something out if we have to. So, uh, okay, so before we get started, one other thing. So, uh, some announcements. So, the last thing I have on my agenda for this semester is a project due at 11 a.m. tomorrow, but after that I'm free, so I'll be in DRL. I'll announce it, I'll be, I'll like take some room, um, some classroom here, and just have office hours from like, I don't know, 1.30 or something on, provided I can turn my project in on time, uh, <laughs> which is not looking good because I, it's like a, like the semester long project I just started yesterday, so we'll <laughs> see how that goes. Um, so yeah, so that's good, I love it, but you can bank on me having office hours pretty much all day, all tomorrow afternoon. Um, what else? I said, so the Piazza is where we're like crowdsourcing answers to the <coughs> previous midterms. I don't have time to do them right now because I do have that project in my hand, but I will be doing them like tomorrow. So we'll like actually get like, like definitive like solutions, or not solutions, but like at least answers to the other professor's midterm, like at some point tomorrow. Um, so like, I just haven't had the time to get through them yet. Um, yeah, so that, the daily problems, I said I was gonna update them today, I'll probably get to tomorrow, but um, we can just come up with some like defective matrices on the spot. Um, that this, this shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, so there's that. And lastly, the final, um, where is it? So it's on the 19th, uh, which is Wednesday, right? So two days from now, it's at 9 a.m. And it's in Chem Building, which is that big red one down there. Um, if you walk past, like, you know where, like, Walnut splits up, or Locust splits up, you go to the School of Design and you, like, take those stairs down, um, and you cross 34th, and it'll be right there. Um, it's, it's a really big auditorium. It's, like, it's about the size of this lecture hall, and so that's where we'll be. Um, Chem 102, I think. So, any questions? Okay. And one other thing, um, I have a survey up on my website. If you haven't filled it out yet, uh, please consider doing so, maybe like after the exam or after you're done with stuff. Um, I'd really appreciate it. It really has a lot to deal with like what I'm doing now, because this is like the first semester where I like, implemented all this um, screen recording and all that stuff. And it seems to be going really well. So um, I plan to do it next semester, and I just want some feedback on that. So all right, let's jump into 
this final exam. So number one, so I'll give you, oh, I'll give you plenty of time to write these problems down. So uh, this final was, I think, 110 points. Um, and if I remember correctly, oh boy, how did we curve this exam? Um, I want to say the median was the median was like a 77-ish. So around, uh, no, not, not quite 77, it was like a 75. So it was like high 60s was like the median um, in terms of percentage points. That's what you would expect on a final. Um, and, I, and I think uh, we gave out 50% A's that semester um, across the entire uh, 240 distribution, but that's not gonna happen this semester because you took it in the fall. Um, the, the, the idea is that students in the second semester are like the kids that came in taking 114, so like they're better students, quote unquote, so they like give a better distribution for the second semester. That's just how it is. Um, yeah. So let's write this. So let R be a three by three matrix. One third, negative two thirds, negative two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, negative one third, two thirds, negative one third, two thirds. Okay, so this is R. So let V equal ABC. Okay. Uh, this is a vector in R3 such that R dot V is equal to V and A minus B plus C is equal to one. So the question is uh, determine the Z coordinate of V. So essentially what we want to find out is what the C guy is. All right, so let me copy that down. So I've had some semesters where like we've only got like 30% A's, and the last semester I had 75% A's. So um, it, it, it like it like varies semester to semester. Um, again, it just depends on how like everyone does on the final um, as a class. I don't know. Actually, that's that's so. There, there's a there's gonna be a really like there's gonna be ex essentially experiment next semester. Experiment next semester where um, me and a friend um, we're gonna be TA 240 for one section, and then there's only one other 240 section, right? So essentially, we're just gonna be competing against the two of us on the final, and we're planning to go really hard on our kids next semester. So we want to see like how much we can like like how much is that like a teacher thing versus like a student thing. Um, we'll get a better sense of that next semester. But anyways, we've had enough time copying this down. So let's think about it. So we have this matrix R. Uh, we need to find a vector V such that it satisfies R V is equal to V and A minus B plus C is equal to one. So how do we even start with this problem? Yeah. Okay, so that's that's one way to do it. You can multiply R and V, um, which I actually think it's the, the intent of this problem is to multiply R and V together and then just like try to bash it out. Um, there's actually a quick, there's actually a shortcut to do this problem. And I actually just realized this um, when I was doing it earlier. Um, there, there's actually a really nice shortcut um, to do this problem quickly, yeah. Can you like augment it with A, B, and C and get A minus B 
Uh, you don't you, you you don't have to do that. Um, well, can you augment it with A B C? Uh, no, because wait, hold on. Can you augment it with A B C? Yeah, you can. Um, but I, I that's that's not the way I was thinking of. Yeah. Well, you can't divide by a vector, right? Like you can't like divide by a vector because the vector is like three by one. So it's like how do you divide a, like a matrix? with a vector, right? So, so that's kind of the idea I was getting at, right? Um, what's really tripping everyone else, uh, what's tripping everyone up is that this matrix is called R, all right? So if we look at this equation, RV is equal to V, what is that really saying? I see hands popping. Just anyone say anything? Is R the identity matrix? No, uh, it could be, but no. But R is not the identity matrix, right? R is R is this guy right here, right? So it's not the identity matrix. Yeah. There's an eigenvalue of one. Yeah, there's an eigenvalue of one, right? Because it's R V is equal to V. So, um, right? There's like a there's like an implicit one here that's not written, right? So what we see is that okay, well, if I did like R V minus v, that's equal to zero, right? So I just move everything over to the one-hand side. So you can subtract that vector. You can't divide it. Um, but that, it's, it's along the right idea. So you want to subtract it. Then this, you get r minus i times v is equal to zero. So right, I have this eigenvalue of one for this matrix r. And so now what I can do then is look at this matrix r minus i and find an eigenvector for it. Right, because that's what v is. V is the eigenvector for this uh, for r minus one. So r minus one, r minus i is equal to negative two thirds, negative two thirds, negative two thirds, two thirds, negative one third, negative one third, two thirds, negative one third, negative one third. Okay, so now with R minus I, now we need to find an eigenvector V. Any ideas? Well, there's one condition we need to satisfy, right? Which is up here, this eigenvector ABC needs to satisfy A minus B plus C is equal to one. Okay, so we could just not worry about that for now. Um, we'll worry about that later, but that's a condition that we need to keep in mind. So you have this matrix. Someone just, what's, what's an eigenvector for this? Yeah. Zero, negative one, one. Yeah, zero, negative one, one. Okay. So that's an eigenvector. This V <coughs> satisfies this equation, all right? So this eigenvector right here, we have this first condition satisfied. That's good. What we don't have is that we don't have the second condition satisfied. Okay, so what do we have right now? Well, the second condition, right, tells me that a minus b plus c equals one. So right now, this is zero minus negative one plus one, and that's equal to two. All right. So so far, that eigenvector, the uh, this the equation applied to the eigenvector gets us two. So how do we get that back down to one? Just divide all the entries by two. Right, so if I divide everything by two, right, it's still an eigenvector, right? Scaling your eigenvector by any multiple, right, is still an eigenvector. Uh, and then so the eigenvector we actually want then is zero, negative one half, one half. And all right, so now we have zero, negative one half, one half. It satisfies the first equation, right, by the fact that it is an eigenvector. And it satisfies the second equation based on the entries inside the eigenvector. So uh, what the question asks for, the z coordinate, right? So the z coordinate's one half, um, which is the answer to this problem. Yeah. Um, is this a multiple choice problem? Was this a multiple choice problem? No, it's just fill in the blank. I think this entire exam was fill in the blank. There is one multiple choice problem. That was uh, that was like 
which of the following circle all that apply? So not really a multiple choice problem. Um, Okay. Yeah. So if you were to go about doing this just by multiplying R and B, you just get three different equations and solve for I think so. I actually didn't do it that way because I was like, I don't want to deal with these fractions. Um, so this problem was actually given on Bob Powers' first midterm. So which if you think about it, there's no way you've gotten the eigenvalues and eigenvectors on the first midterm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what the point of this problem is. This is the like this is this is definitely the way to do it. Um, I guess is I guess the point of him putting it on the first midterm is for you to just bash out the multiplication and like solve that system. I do think you get like three equations, three unknowns, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? Okay. Question number two. Uh, so, if I remember correctly, nobody missed this problem. Out of like 300 kids that took it. So, why did no one miss it? Well, it's express the matrix negative 1, 2, 3, 1 as a linear combination. Uh, of a times 1, 0, 0, negative 1, plus B times 0, 1, 1, 0, plus C, 0, negative 1, 1, 0. Wait, is that it? Yeah, OK, I guess. Right? So the problem asks you to find A, B, C. All right, this is a super easy problem. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know why they put it on this exam, but. All right, so how do we do this? Uh, well, you know, then we'll unravel these matrices. So you get like, or you get like 1, 0, 0, negative 1 times A plus B times 0, 1, 1, 0. I'm doing this in a super like roundabout way, right? Times C is equal to negative 1, 2, 3, 1. And then you just put this in a big matrix. So now this is 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. 0, negative 1, 1, 0. And then you augment it. Negative 1, 2, 3, 1. All right, now we row reduce and we solve for A, B, C. So remember, this, would, this row, this column gets you A, this column gets you B, this column gets you C. Okay, so you get 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 1, 2. And now we'll do some reducing. 0, 0, 2, 1. And this gets you 0, 0, 0, 0. All right, uh, what can we see? Well, this last row, right, right here, this automatically gives me c is equal to 1 half. And then up here, this is b minus c is equal to 2. And since c is 1 half, that means b is equal to 5 halves. And then up top, this immediately gives me a is equal to negative 1. So you get a is negative 1, b is 5 halves, c is 1 half. All right, 10 points. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can. Um, the e to at that's just another way to do it. Okay. Um, we didn't really, we didn't cover matrix exponential in this class. I don't think explicitly. I don't think anyone did. Although I should take a look at their homeworks to see if they did. But um, so I don't think you have to worry about the exponential. I talked about it like briefly, right, in recitation. So it's good to know, especially for like a diagonalizable matrix. It's like good to know, but you don't have to do it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the actual question was just express the matrix in terms of this linear combination. Any other questions? 
Yeah, this one's super straightforward. Like I said, nobody missed this problem. Um, I think if you did, we just gave you an F. No, I don't. We didn't. I don't think we failed anyone last semester. So. Um, okay. And for those of you saying that you should have taken it last semester, I think the highest instructor quality out of all three instructors was like a 0 0.9. So there, there, there was a trade-off. Um, okay, number three. Also super easy. Yeah, they're 11. Yeah, that's one 10 points is 11. Yeah, these are all worth 10 points. So let y of t be a smooth function. So this is just all jibber jabber, uh, which satisfies the Diffie Q So, okay, I'm just going to write this really weird because it's nice to see really weird notation. I mean, we've all seen it. Okay, so essentially a second order differential equation and the initial conditions. Y of zero is equal to zero. DY DT evaluated at T equals zero is equal to one. And so the question is find y of 1. <clears throat> OK, so. This is just a homogeneous linear differential equation with an initial value condition. So there's absolutely like no tricks to this problem. It's just solve it. Um, okay, so what do you do? Uh, you do the following. So I mean, here's the right. You get d squared minus three d plus two is equal to zero. This is d minus two d minus 1, okay? And so you get y is equal to c1 e to the 2t plus c2 e to the t. Okay, so, I mean, we if you studied for the last midterm, then you would have known this. I feel like if you didn't study for the last midterm, you would have known this too. Um, so now what? So now y prime uh, is equal to 2c1 e to the 2t plus c2 e to the t. Okay, uh, now we need to use these initial value conditions. Right, so y at 0 uh, is what? Well, e to the 2t, that's gone. e to the t, that's gone. So this is c1 plus c2. And y prime at 0, this is 2c1 plus c2. Uh, the top equals 0, the bottom equals 1. All right, and that's just from the initial value conditions given. OK, so now you have this system of equations to solve right here. Um, it's really simple. You just subtract the bottom one. Uh, you, do top minus, uh, you do bottom minus top or top minus bottom. Um, and you get C1 is equal to 1 and C2 is equal to negative 1. So then Y of T is equal to E to the 2T minus E to the T. So that's plugging in our constants. And then the problem, right, asks you for Y of 1. So actually, like, answer the problem. And so for Y of 1, E squared minus E is the solution. Okay, are we feeling good so far? All right, nothing too bad. All right, and then they hit you with this. Um, for find a particular solution y of x of the Diffie Q d 
d dx minus 1 squared d dx plus 1 y is equal to, um, I guess they like do some extra stuff in here, so I'll just write it in for completeness. So they like multiply it out, which just seems really unnecessary. Uh, I guess it's not unnecessary, it's needed. And this is equal to 24x plus 1 e to the x. So, first of all, you don't actually have to like solve the entire thing. You just need to find out a particular solution. So that's what this is here. Like, it's just a particular solution. Uh, you have a question? So why would they include the part before multiplying that? Because it, 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 it factors it for you. Well, you, could, you could also just make a particular guess and then point back to yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess they're just nice. They just factor it for you. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, any ideas? So there's actually like there's actually like a so Bob Powers had a way to do these problems. It's like you guess some polynomial, which like absolutely makes no sense to me, um, and you just like blindly follow it on like a formula sheet. I mean, the way I did it here was I just bashed out the derivatives. Um, there's really no other way to do it. So let's consider then uh, how, we, how we would do it. So, so I guess the way to do it would be using, using the method of undetermined coefficients. All right, so now we have to guess yp of x Okay, and what do we guess for y, p of x? <clears throat> not just a x squared e to the x. Well, it's not even a x squared e to the x. Yeah. Yeah, so. We want to guess something like a x e to the x plus b e to the x initially, right? And why do we do that? Um, this right hand side, it's it's like a polynomial times e to the x. So this is some polynomial, and this is e to the x. Um, when you have a polynomial, you can just take the highest term and guess based on that guy. Because they'll automatically kill the lower terms, right? So you can like multiply it out, and then you'd have like 24x. Like if we did multiply it out, this would be 24x e to the x plus 24e to the x, right? And then you would like guess a particular for this guy, and you would guess a particular for that guy, right? And then you would have to like multiply. You have to like add them, I think, right? Or you have to you have to multiply the annihilators, which is. Um, what you do with annihilators. But the, the thing is, the annihilator for this guy automatically kills this guy. All right? So then we only need the particular guess for the higher power term. So we only need a guess for this guy, which is right here. Okay? But that, that's not the right guess. All right? Why not? <coughs> yeah, there's the like the d minus one squared out in front, okay? Which which like the root of this is d equals one, which is what that is, okay? So what do you have to do? Yeah, we have to multiply the entire thing by x squared. So now you have to take this entire thing and multiply by x squared. So. Uh, the particular solution then, so this is the guess there. 
uh, we would actually guess y p of x is equal to a x squared e to the x or a x cubed e to the x plus b x squared e to the x. Yeah. Why we need a multiply by x squared? So if we if we just plugged in that purple line guy into our Diffie Q, uh, the problem is that this guy would have just killed all that. All right, because the the annihilator for the annihilator for what I have circled in blue is d minus one squared. So the problem there is that. If this is your particular solution gas, you can't have it get killed because then it's not a particular solution, it's a homogeneous solution. So in order to make this gas not a homogeneous solution, you need to multiply it by whatever power this is um, out in front. And so we multiply it by this x squared term, or x to whatever power, yeah. Right, right, right. Because, because first we guessed, so, so first you have to guess for this guy, right? And then, because this term, these two terms correspond to that 24x e to the x, right? Which also happens to kill that guy as well, right? So you know for sure that these two guys kill these two guys, right? But the problem is, this guy then kills this guy, All right? So you need something to happen where this derivative operator will not get rid of your guess, all right? But you still want to keep the same structure of your guess because you know your guess kills the right-hand side. So you, just the power. so you just multiply the power of how many, like whatever it occurs. So, so yeah, so now we take all of this And we multiply it by x squared. OK, I think there's, on a previous exam, there's like a problem that looks a lot like this on one of the previous finals. And someone posted about it. Apparently, I have the wrong particular solution guess, even though I like, I, I haven't gone back and looked at it yet. But there's, there's an exam on our previous, there's, there's a problem that's really similar to this one on the previous finals. OK, so we get this guess. We multiply everything by x squared, because that's the power there. Um, so now what? Now we got to take our derivatives, OK? So here's an exercise in where the product rule and keeping track of your derivatives actually makes this problem really simple. So well, not really simple, but more manageable than you think it will be. So you have y p of x is equal to this. I'm going to write it with the e to the x out. So this is e to the x times ax cubed plus bx squared. All right, does that make sense? I just pulled the e to the x out of the, out of the equation. All right, so what's next? Well, we got to take the derivative. So here's y prime of x. All right, and so what I can do is that I can treat this term and this term in the bracket as two separate terms. I'll just use the product rule. So what happens is, OK, I can take the derivative of the first guy, which is e to the x, and then I'll just leave the second guy unchanged. All right? And then I need to add the derivative of the second guy, which is 3ax squared plus b, uh, 2bx. And then I'm, so I took the derivative of the pink term, and then now I'm going to multiply by e to the x. All right, so just, that's, just, that's just the product rule. So the next step then is to apply the product rule again. All right, but what is this? This first term is the exact same thing as what we had above, right? It's literally the exact same thing. So I just take the product rule on that, which gets me <coughs> ax cubed plus bx squared plus 
3ax squared plus 2bx <coughs> e the x, right? So that's the product of the first term in y prime. This is y double prime. And now I need to take the product rule of this guy in e the x. So what I'm going to do first is take the derivative of e the x, which let, makes it stay as e the x. So this is e the x. And then I multiply by the underlined in green. So that's 3ax squared plus 2bx. All right. And now I take the derivative of what's ever in the parentheses and multiply that by e the x. So I'm actually going to write the e the x on front. Take the derivative inside the parentheses. Um, and you get what? You get 6ax plus 2b. OK. So again, uh, let's say, so here this is d dx of e the x. And then this didn't change. And then this guy here, this is d dx of the parentheses term is equal to that guy in green. Right, so it's just the product rule over and over. You can combine the middle two terms. So this is e the x, ax cubed plus bx squared plus 2, 3ax squared plus 2bx, or let's say 2e to the x times that, and then plus e to the x, 6ax plus 2b. Okay, so now we need to find y triple prime. And so you do this product rule derivative thing over and over. Uh, the thing is, it actually kind of looks like Pascal's triangle uh, in the sense that here, here the coefficient is 1. Here the coefficient is 1. This coefficient is 1. And here, this coefficient is 1, this coefficient is 2, and that coefficient is 1. And if you keep on doing this derivative, the next layer below actually has like 1, 3, 3, 1 as your coefficients. All right, so it actually works out that way. Um, and the only reason that happens is because this guy's e to the x. But that's, that's the only reason. If it were like e to the anything else x, it would it, get messed up. Then you'd have to be more careful with this derivative taking. But if we just continue on with the product rule, right? so you just take another derivative with the product rule here, you'd get e to the x, ax cubed plus bx squared, all right, plus 3e to the x, 3ax squared plus 2bx, plus 3ex, 6ax plus 2b, and then now you add e to the x, and now you need to take the derivative of, what color haven't I used? You need to take the derivative of that, which is just 6a. I think a few people did it, right? Like, but it was expected to do this. There, I, like I said, there's the there's like a trick that like Powers kids had, where you'd like guess some polynomial, and you'd roll with it. I, I don't know if I actually. I don't think I did it on the other final problem that looks like this. But, uh, yeah, if you knew that, like that shortcut, <laughs> I might I might go dig it up. Um, I don't expect you to learn it that quickly. It, it also is like pretty nonsensical, so yeah. Why isn't the particular solution three terms? Because the um, annihilator is the one that's supposed to be Where the, up here? Like why isn't the particular solution ax to the fourth cube x plus bx cubed <coughs> 
Well, the with the annihilator on the right hand side is just d minus one squared, right? Because because you want you want to say it's cubed because you also have this term right here, which is the twenty four e to the x. So you want to like multiply that term in, right? So then you would have d minus one squared times d minus one, right? But the thing is, d minus one squared already kills the other guy. So you don't need that other d minus one. Does that? Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we're here. And so now comes, I don't know, I thought this part was cool, but it might just be super confusing. I'm going to erase these coefficients now, these yellow coefficients. They're just in the way. Um, so what happens is, right, we need to find this is really like y triple prime minus y double prime minus y plus y, or minus y prime plus y. So we're adding this guy, we're subtracting this guy, we're subtracting this guy, and we're adding this guy. Okay, so what happens? You get this term minus this term, so they kill each other. Right? And then you have this term and this term, and they also kill each other. Right? Because you're adding the one on top, but you're subtracting this one on the bottom. So these terms are all gone. So that first column of terms I had, they're, they're, they're all gone. Okay, what else? Here you have you're adding three. Now here you're subtracting two, right? Because this is a minus, you're subtracting two. And then here you're subtracting, oh, that's the wrong one. Up here you're subtracting one. Right? So you have three minus two minus one, so these terms are all gone. And so what's left is really you're just doing this guy minus this guy, right, since this is a minus here, uh, you're subtracting that positive term. And then you have the remaining e, uh, 6a e to the x. So what's remaining when you do this is 3, well, 3 minus e to the x. So it's 3 e to the x times this stuff minus e to the x times 6ax plus 2b, and then you add 6x, uh, e to the x times 6a. So that's equal to 2e to the x, 6ax plus 2b, plus, and then this is really 6a e to the x. Okay, and what is this equal to? Well, if you go back to this original equation up here, this is equal to 24 x plus 1 e to the x. So that's equal to 24 x plus 1 e to the x. So this mess in the middle here, this is just taking derivatives. Um, if you look on my sheet, it's actually a lot cleaner than what it is on the screen. Uh, so if you, if you know how to take these derivatives using the product rule, you can just lay them out. Uh, in a pretty orderly fashion. All right, so now you have this going on. And you get the following. You get 12x a, or 12a, x e the x, plus 4b e the x, plus 6a e the x is equal to and then this right-hand side is really 24x e to the x plus 24e to the x. So we're multiplying that out. So the only x e to the x term comes from this 12a. So that tells me a is equal to 2. Isn't it 18? Uh, sure, no, it's 24. No. 
So a is equal to 2. And then what now? So now if you look at the remaining terms, um, you get 4b e to the x plus 12 e to the x is equal to 24 e to the x. So a equals 2 from the x e to the x terms. And here's the remaining ones. And then you get that b here should be equal to 3. So you get a equals 2, b equals 3. And then you plug that into our guess at the beginning, which was 2x cubed e to the x plus 3x squared e to the x. <coughs> Okay, this is just a really long problem. Uh, it's, it's about what it is. I mean, you were given like two freebies pretty much, like right before this one. So like something has to give, right? Um, any questions? Okay. Does anyone need a screen still? And granted, you have like, what, you have two hours for 11 problems, so that's like 10 minutes a problem. Um, the previous like two problems should have taken you like maybe like eight minutes total, right? Because they're like not that bad. So you would have had like a little more time to spend on this one, but yeah, there wasn't any way. This, this next problem is also a time sink. So number five, which one which ones of the following four systems of Diffie Q's uh, have the property that all of its solutions remain bounded as t approaches infinity. <coughs> all right, and then this is the circle all that apply, and then you're given four of them. So you have a d d t of x t. Yt, all right, this is the last time I'm going to write like this, is 0, 5, 2, 7, x of t, y of t. All right, it's just a really long way of writing x prime is equal to x. All right, b, x prime is equal to negative 5, 1, 2, negative 2, x, c, um, x prime is equal to 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, x, and d, x prime is equal to 2, 3, 1, 1, x. All right, so you have four systems of equations, and you have to figure out which one of these have bounded solutions um, as t goes to infinity. So I guess the big question uh, coming into this problem is, how do you know if a solution uh, is going to be bounded? Like, what are we looking for? Negative eigenvalues, right? That's one of them. Uh, what else? Well, yeah, negative eigenvalues. Um, but what if they're imaginary? Then what? Yeah, the real part has to be negative. Someone mumbled it. But right, if you have a plus bi, or a minus bi, um, if a is negative, then that thing will remain bounded, because that's the like e to the ax part. Okay. So when we're looking for bounded stuff, we're looking for um, eigenvalues. Although um, 
the, the way that bounded and limit are different, right, is the case where you have I, the eigenvalue being zero on the real part. So that's like the, the, that's like the big difference. Um, so usually, well, I, we, so not usually, but limit implies it's going to be bounded. So if the limit exists, then it's bounded. Um, if it's bounded, it does not mean the limit's going to exist. Right, so, so, so it'd be bounded. Oh, that is, oh, it is bounded, right? Because you're just going from zero to one, but there's no limit, okay. right? So that's like the counter example to that second statement I have on there, right? If you have like e to the i, t, right? Then you just oscillate like this. Um, but if it's bounded, then that li uh, if the limit exists, then like it, it's gonna be bounded. Yeah. But this, this problem is only asking for bounded. So um, if it's asking for bounded, you have to be really careful with the uh, lambda equals zero case. And in general, you have to just be really careful with the zero eigenvalue case. Um, that, that's just, whenever you see eigenvalue equals zero, uh, you, you, you need to be a little more careful. Okay, so let's approach this problem then. Uh, a, okay, so you have zero, five, two, seven. So you need to find the determinant of negative lambda 5, 2, and 7 minus lambda. Okay, and what is this? Um, this is negative lambda times 7 minus lambda minus 10, which is lambda squared minus 7 lambda minus 10. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So what are my eigenvalues for this? Two and five? All right, so I always send a long ass email to my students uh, after the exam. Um, and last semester when I sent this email, I said that when you factor lambda squared minus seven lambda minus 10, you don't get two and five as your eigenvalue, as your, as your roots, okay? Like everyone just looks at this and they're like two and five, they have to be there. Um, well, if you do seven plus or minus the square root of 49 plus 40 over two, it, it's kind of obvious that you don't have five and two. So a lot of people got this wrong because I think if you say five and two, do you get the wrong answer? Well, I think you still get the right answer, but I, I graded this problem. I remember I just counted like, I took like two points off. Um, but yeah, be careful with the factoring. These are your roots. Uh, and so lambda is equal to seven plus or minus root 89 over two. Okay, so those are your roots. Okay, but what does the problem ask? The problem asks, which of the following four systems have the property that all of its solutions remain bounded, right? So here, I mean, if you just take the plus sign, right? If you just take seven plus root 89, there's no way that's negative. So um, this one's not bounded. No, because it's C, E to the lambda T. Yeah, so if you set that concept to zero. Uh, that's trivial, that's true, for that, that all of them are true. Um, I think, yeah, I, I actually, that's actually a good one. I don't think anyone like tried to game the system that was like, oh, if you set C equal to zero, then all of these are bounded. Um, I think uh, that wasn't the intent of the problem, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, right, so this is our, eigen, these are our eigenvalues right here. So our system, our solution would have been uh, x of t 
if we write it out, is like C1 e to the 7 plus root 89 over 2 plus C uh, times t plus C2 e to the 7 minus root 89 over 2 times t. All right, so because the eigenvalues go in there. So if we send t to infinity, right, one of these is going to blow up, right, because because this guy, this guy is positive, right? So t times a positive number as t goes to infinity, that's infinity. So then this term is e to the infinity, right, which is infinity, right? So, so it's not bounded. It can't be bounded if it's going to infinity. Um, this term, however, like root 89 is bigger than 7. So this is actually negative, right? And then when t goes to infinity times a negative number, you get e to the negative infinity. But e to the negative infinity is 0, right? So that's why we're looking for negative eigenvalues. But it has to be negative for both because the problem's asking for all of its solutions are bounded. And here, only one of them are. Okay, So that's why this one's considered not bounded. Even though this solution right here, this is technically the one with the minus sign, it's technically bounded. But the entire system isn't. Any other questions? All right, so that's the first one, uh, B then you want the determinant of negative 5 minus lambda, 1, 2, negative 2 minus lambda, which is equal to, uh, so you get, uh, okay, lambda squared plus 7 lambda plus 10 minus 2. So that's lambda squared plus 7 lambda plus 8. All right, it was really popular to factorize this guy as lambda plus one, lambda plus seven. Um, just be careful. So this one, uh, lambda is equal to, again, negative seven plus or minus the square root of 49 minus 32 over two. Okay, so you actually get, let's actually write these out separately. So you get seven, negative 7 plus root 17 over 2. You get negative 7 minus root 17 over 2. <coughs> All right, this minus guy is obviously less than 0, because right, you have a negative minus a negative number. So that's uh, so we get negative minus a number, so that's less than 0. Um, so now it just remains to see if this guy is less than 0 or not, and it is, right? because root 17 is like 4. It like, doesn't matter. It's about 4. And so 4 is less than 7. So negative 7 plus 4 is going to be negative. All right, so this guy's also negative. So we have, two, we have two negative roots, right? So this one is bounded. All right, C. 1 minus lambda, 1, 1, neg uh, negative 1, negative 1 minus lambda. Okay, so take the determinant of this. What do you get? Um, you get? You get lambda squared minus lambda plus lambda plus 1, uh, minus 1 plus 1. So that's just equal to lambda squared. So that's equal to 0. So lambda is equal to 0 with multiplicity 2. All right, so like I said, with the multiplicity, so with the multiplicity case, right, whenever you have multiplicity, um, you need to go look at to see if it's defective or not. So now you see that, OK, what is a minus 0i? Well, that's just a. And so that's 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. Well, here's the thing. The rank is 1. The nullity is 0. Uh, the rank is 1. The nullity is 1. Sorry. So what does that tell me? Yeah, it's defective. So not only do we have this lambda equals 0 case where we have to be like really careful with it anyways, um, it's also defective, which also throws a wrench into what we're doing. So, okay, so now what? Um, 
might as well try to find the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of this guy. Um, so for a 2 by 2, if you square a, or a minus 0i squared, this is really what it is. But that's just a squared. Um, that's, that, that gets you the zero matrix, right? In a 2 by 2 defective matrix, when you square it, you'll always get the zero matrix. So find a generalized eigenvector. All right, we're just going to take one zero. And then a times vg is equal to 1, negative 1. So here's the generalized eigenvector. Here's the actual eigenvector. And then for my system, that's e to, uh, c1 e to the 0t times 1, negative 1 plus c2 e to the 0t t 1, negative 1 plus 1, 0. Yeah. Yeah, so the generalized eigenvector, right, the generalized eigenvector just means that a minus lambda i squared times the generalized eigenvector is 0, but a minus lambda i times the generalized eigenvector is not 0. So this is for a 2 by 2 case, right? And so, I mean, a minus lambda i squared in our case was the zero matrix. So I could literally pick like almost anything. And I just pick one zero because it's like the easiest one to pick. Um, and then, then I had to take a times one zero, which gets me this guy. Yeah. Yeah, you can. You have just like you can have like two two on the diagonal. Oh well, so so the lambda equals two case will get you only two, right? I think I like proved that. I said something along the lines of, um, so 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 you're ask so. Could you rephrase your question? Like, so if you have if you have a repeated eigenvector with a two by two system, eigenvalue, okay, eigenvalue, yeah, can you ever have it be non-defective? Yeah, yeah, a diagonal matrix with the same value on the diagonal, which is why I gave the two two like two zero zero two. All right, if you have two zero zero two. What's your eigenvalue? It's two. All right, you subtract from the diagonals, and I got the zero matrix. Yeah, so that's, that's literally the only case. Yeah? Uh, is it like a coincidence that A times your generalized eigenvector just equals that your eigenvector for A, or is that just like the definition? No, this, this one always will end up being the eigenvector. Okay. So this one will, so, so the idea is this is your generalized eigenvector, it generates an eigenvector. It, it generates another eigenvector. So you can actually like reduce this guy. Right, so if I pick like two zero for some reason, because I could literally pick anything here, then this would be two negative two, right? And it's really tempting to like make that one negative one just divide everything by two, but you can't because you picked two zero. Okay. Okay. Well, that's not the point of this problem. This just happened to be a defective matrix. Um, the point of this problem is, are the solutions bounded when t goes to infinity? The answer is no. So it's because it's it's because of this pesky t right here, right? That that's the t that blows everything up because every other t gets eaten up by the zero, right? Like if we actually simplify this, this is actually just c one one negative one plus c two times t one negative one plus uh, one zero. So the only t that exists in the system is this one. And so if you let t go to infinity, it just shoots everything else to infinity. And so this one's not bounded. Yeah, so here's my system, right? Here's one of the solutions. Here's the other solution, right? The question's asking um, which one are bounded 
that all so that all of its solutions are bound as t goes to infinity. Um, this t right here, there's nothing to check it, right? There's no like e to the negative lamb e to the negative something t, right? To check that t, so that t just keeps on increasing, and so this second solution just keeps on going up. So this first solution is actually bounded, right? This one's bounded, but this one's not bounded. For for lambda equals zero. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so if if this were any other eigenvalue, uh, you, I think if it were a negative eigenvalue, you'd actually be able to kill the guy. Yeah, you would. Yeah, I mean, I covered it. The one recitation. That's like the only thing I did was like the three by three cases. Um, that actually would generalize to higher dimensional matrices, but. I, like I don't think a four by four will show up. Like I don't think I've seen a four by four show up. So I think the most you have to worry about is like a three by three. <laughs> how this one isn't bound? This first one's bounded. There's no t attached to this. So 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 like because it's e to the zero t, right? So that just simplifies the e to the zero, which is one. Yeah, this solution is just like a vector, right? There's no t. So if you take t to the infinity, right, but there's no t attached to it, it like it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Any other questions? This this one's like the trick. This one's like the one that trips a lot, trips a lot of people up. Besides the factoring stuff on the first one. <laughs> Okay, the last one is 2, 3, 1, 1. Okay, so you get D. So you get 2 minus lambda, 3, 1, 1 minus lambda. Okay, and again, this is the determinant of this is equal to 2 minus lambda, 1 minus lambda, minus 3. Lambda squared minus three lambda minus one. Okay, here you go. Lambda mi lambda squared minus three lambda minus one. Can't factor this, so uh, so you get three plus or minus the square root of nine minus uh, plus four over two. And this one's just unbounded because it has a positive real part. So again, the, the, the caveat to this problem is what I'm saying, unbounded. I don't mean it's all unbounded. I'm just saying that one of the solutions will blow up, right? Because of the phrasing of the problem, which has this emphasis on all. So like for part A and part D, and also part C, um, you would have solutions that might have been bounded anyways. Uh, or like one of them would have been bounded, but the other one isn't. So then that violates the problem. Okay, any, any questions on this? Okay, let me see what six is. Um, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, let's do six real quick. This one's... We'll do six and they'll take a break. Um, so this one's also incredibly dumb. Uh, you all know how to do it. It's just a matter of can you do it quickly? And you'll see that like the, this this problem is actually pretty pointless. Uh, it's just really computationally tedious. So B suppose B is a four by four matrix with eigenvalues lambda one equals zero, lambda two equals one, lambda three equals negative one. Lambda 4 equals 2, and the corresponding eigenvectors 
v1 equals 1, 1, 1, 1. v2 equals 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. v3 equals 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. v4 equals 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. What is b? I have to find it, compute it explicitly. Okay, so how how do we approach this problem? Yeah, you, you use the diagonalized thing, right? Well, the, the problem with the diagonalized thing is that you need to compute an inverse matrix of a 4 by 4. And then you have to multiply the entire thing out. So we're not going to do the entire thing. But B is SDS inverse. All right. So what is D? Yeah, 0, 1, negative 1, 2. All right, and then S, well, S is just going to be, all right, so here's 0, right? Oops. So 0 goes with this first eigenvector, so that's 1, 1, 1, 1. And then here's 1. It's this guy. It goes with the second eigenvector. So that's 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. You get the idea. So this third one is going to be 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. Goes with that guy. Fourth is 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. Goes with this guy. And then the really fun part is finding S inverse. Did they say that the, like, the I was an eigenvector? Yeah, it's, oh. it says corresponding eigenvectors in the problem, right? Oh, did not read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so here we go. This is the matrix. You have this 4x4. Four four. You have that diagonal matrix right there. Um, you need to invert. So you need to find the inverse of this guy, which is really fun. And it takes a long time. Uh, and then after you're done with that, you have to multiply this entire thing out, which is also really fun and takes a long time. Um, so we're not going to do it. It's a waste of time, but it's just, it's just computation. Does that, are we okay with that? Yeah? All right. So, uh, so now let's just take a break. Let's take a quick break. Uh, I'll say like five minutes and then we'll be back. Um, let's say eight, like 27, 28. Do you remember how second No, I, I don't have access to any of them. Oh, so okay. only Davi does and he did yeah, get the second yeah. one. So. Because I like emailed Davi about it and then he didn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If there's like nothing there that like is what you're supposed to do, then no, I think I'll put answers on. So if I can like, if I can see like any possible line that like match anything. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, see me. Like, I, I didn't. The problem is, I didn't grade any of this. Like, Dobby graded. Like, well, I graded like one problem. Dobby graded like a card there. So, um, yeah, then I, like, I don't, I don't know how you like that. That's not good. Um, I have a question on this. So, I saw this and, like, thought I was really clever and, like, oh, this is just a, um, it's simple harmonic motion that yeah. if it's damped, then it would approach zero. Like this just describes a damped system where C over M is greater than zero. So I thought I was clever and just I'm just yeah, like I was asking my friend who like actually solved the homogeneous equation with like D squared yeah, plus C I over think M D. You Why? Wanted to see, you wanted to see like the discriminant, which is like it like C squared minus, yeah, like, minus. Like, AM or something like that. Why is this wrong though? It's, it's, if C is greater oh, I can't. Like it's just a damn any No, I think there's a C less than zero case. Or C I over M is greater if C over M is greater than zero. Like I know like I it, it was funny because I'm 
I'm in an electrical circuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh, this is just an RLC circuit and anything with the real yeah. R. And like, I was like, oh, like this is like, I was like, oh, this is cake. It's any circuit with an R with a resistor. Yeah. I, 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 I have no idea what this looks like. Would it be like yeah. Word? Yeah. Is it like yeah. Word yeah. like asking him? Like, I just wrote six of mushrooms again with just getting all the energy through friction. Yeah, I guess it doesn't fully explain. Yeah, 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 I guess, like, you can try to explain it. Like, I, uh, it just sucks because I got every yeah. problem right here. Yeah. It felt so hard. It felt like it's still awesome. Right? I don't think so. Oh, that was you who said that. Yeah, yeah. Like, the people who have the worst rate. Right? Yeah, maybe like see a picture of the page and email him and just ask him like what his reasoning is. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was looking for like that's the that's the problem. If you're looking for war, you're always looking for a person that's so I thought it was like a conceptual question that he wanted. Yeah, I I I Okay, thank you. Oh, you didn't grade this problem. I didn't grade this problem. Alright, thank you. I don't know if you like covered this at the beginning of this review session, but if you created past finals, like when it, whenever it's like multiple choice, it's like most of the problems are. You guys so are grading, like. For yeah, we're, we're only grading for work. Um, and like, do you, you guys, but you still get partial credit if you get the multiple yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, um, yeah. so. Yeah. This, I, yeah. There's a question on the midterm okay. about annihilators. Okay. And so yeah, yeah. for e to the x plus sine x, right. you, do you get do the annihilator for both separately and then multiply them? I don't think you e to the x plus sine x. Yeah. You add the no the annihilator no the annihilator you multiply. You not you add the particular solution, yes. But you multiply the annihilator. Because, so, yeah, yeah, when yeah. you said you're going to go through and check those tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said at the beginning, like, I don't have time until, like, 11 a.m. No, no. I'm, oh, yeah, I'll go through and do all the... I do all the... Yeah, because yeah, there was something that we... I really saw it was like, right, right, right. And so... Yeah. You, um, you can just pretty much always use a particular guess instead of an annihilator, right? Yeah, yeah, you don't ever have to set up that now. Okay, yeah, I feel just, like it's pretty ridiculous to do. Yeah. No, but a lot of these professors use the annihilator setup, so you'd have oh, to come I don't know, yeah, yeah it's always important. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, I don't, I guess they just really like the physics thing. How much should we do? Yeah. I don't know, like, like, it's always nice to have, like, so the one thing is, like, the physics thing, like, you can't really predict, like, what is going to be on the exam for the physics, because they literally have all of physics diffuse to reach into, so maybe, like, maybe, like, the examples of the ones they have on the midterms on there, which like I, I did we the, put the we, we put the pendulum one on where it's like where it's like find uh, the period or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 I feel like that. Yeah, I feel like that's the kind of thing. Like it's up to Davi to like. I don't think did he talk about periods and whatever in class. No. Yeah. So that's up to him to like strike those kind of problems on the midterm from the final. But it's like I didn't cover this in class, so we shouldn't put this on there. Oh, um, but then that's also a good reason why you like you should do the other professional exams, just in case I like, want to do just act like this. Well, it's just it's like that's like the, the part of their class that they chose, and we also don't know like, what else they cover. That they <laughs> no, yeah. that's why you said that. It's not like it's but there's they, also yeah, stuff Davi is gonna that. like kind of check. Like, they won't put stuff he didn't ever do. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the problem. Be, like, Davi did go. Yeah, Davi did go like kind of slow this semester. Yeah. So if anything, it's like other people cover stuff that we didn't cover. But yeah. Um, yeah. So our per the percentage of A's for our section depends on how many people get A's on this final. Yeah. So you're kind of rooting for your class to do well, which is why like I'm trying to get you guys to like collaborate on the solutions yeah. to the, the, the other midterms. Because just like yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And, like, how much of people's grades are like locked in already? Sixty percent. Right. It's 40%. The, the, the final's forty. It's, it's okay. huge. Yeah, it's, it's a hard part. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, that sucks, but... All right, so, right. Right. I know you yeah, do. Talk. So is it like 3%? I mean, just overall, we get like between 35 and 40. I think very small. I mean, I said I've I've gone low as like thirty. I've gone as high as seventy five. So it really just depends on how much it costs. Thank you. <laughs> So let's see. Um, we're on number seven, and this one's number seven's not applicable at all because we didn't cover this, um, except the first part, I guess. So, let's talk about the first part. Um, you have to consider the Diffie Q. Uh, of a function yt so you get d squared y dt squared minus dy dt minus 4 sine yt is equal to 0 um, so this problem can only really do part a which is write down an autonomous system of first order uh, nonlinear in parentheses ODE which is equivalent to the above Diffie Q. All right, so essentially it's just asking you to convert this guy um, into a system. All right, so you have a Diffie Q, you want to convert it into a system of equations. So I think I had like a practice problem or two on this for midterm three. Okay, does anyone know remember how to do these types of problems? Yeah. Don't you set um, dy and t equal to and then you 
something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we kind of just have to like assign arbitrary uh, values to these guys. So what we're going to do is the following. So we're going to let like y1 equal y of t and then y2 is equal to dy dt. All right, because now we can do the following. Now what we want to do is we want to say like y1 prime y2 prime is equal to some matrix times y1 y2. All right, so you want it to kind of set up like x prime is equal to x. Well, this is like y prime is equal to like a y. Okay. So you always start off like this. You let y1 equal like just y and then y2 is equal to the derivative. So now, right, what are we interested in? We want to find y1 prime and we want to find y2 prime. So y1 prime, well, that's just dy dt, right? Because I'm just literally taking the derivative of this guy with respect to t. Um, but what is dy dt? Yeah, it's y2. So that's y1, yeah. You have a question? You almost always do this. It's just something you do. So you always let y1 equal that and y2 equal the derivative. OK, so y2 prime is equal to now dy squared dt. And we don't really have a dy squared dt squared, or dt squared. Um, or d squared t, whatever the correct way, it's d squared t. Anyways, so we don't really have like the second derivative, but we can get the second derivative from up here, right? So we can solve the system of equations, uh, or this differential equation, for d squared y dt squared, which is how you're supposed to write it, apparently. So from above, we see that this guy becomes d squared y dt squared is dy dt plus 4 sine y t. So now we plug that in here. This is dy dt plus 4 sine y t. But again, now we ask ourselves, what is dy dt? Yeah, it's y2. Hold on, this is getting a little wonky. <coughs> no, I think it's right. Yeah, so. Yeah, so this is y2 plus 4 sine y of t. Yeah, there's no there's no y term, so that's why there's no just y one. Oh, actually, there is a y term. This y of t is y one, right? Y of t is y one, so we need to, we can make that change right there. There we go. That makes sense. So really, you have um, this system y one prime is equal to y two. And then you have the second thing, y2 prime is equal to y2 plus 4 sine y1. Any questions? This is just, it's one of those things where like you have to see once, just like get that initial substitution down, and then uh, everything else isn't that bad yet. Uh, so only the y2s go in here, and then you would have like a plus 4 sine y1 down here. So that's how you would do it. It's like an inhomogeneous system.
Well, it, the original equation is biased, but you, because we have to move it to the right-hand side, it becomes plus. Right? When we saw when we saw for this stuff right here, when we did it, when we solved it here. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there like a way to know that this just naming is valid? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. Th these type of problems actually don't exist that much. If you look at previous finals, I think this is the only final that has this type of problem. Okay. So, uh, so that's 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 another thing. So last semester, my professor told me that there's going to be four non-traditional problems on this final, and it kind of like became like a meme where everyone's like, "Oh shit, there's four non-traditional problems. We're fucked." Like, um, this is one of them. Like, you actually this actually doesn't exist on any other final, but like it actually came up on one of our midterms. So. All right, so that's part A. Part B deals with like equilibrium points of the autonomous system. We didn't cover that this semester, so we're not going to talk about that. All right, number eight. Yeah. What goes in the matrix? Uh, well, essentially y one, y two. So this would be like, what would this be? This would be zero one zero one. Is that right? Oh, you have to add that on on the end here. Like that would be the matrix, right? This this is like an inhomogeneous term, so you kind of have to just like leave it off. Wait, unless unless I'm being dumb. No, uh, I I am. Wait. Yeah, you can't really put four sine y one in here, right? The yeah. So. Side. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I wouldn't. I worry about. I wouldn't worry about putting this in the matrix. You won't have to do that. So that would be a satisfactory final answer? Yeah, this right here is, is, the, is the answer. I think that's, that is the answer they're looking for. So, Okay, number eight. Um, all right, this is also a really long-winded one, but let x of t, y of t, z of t be functions in t such that d d t of x of t, y of t, z of t is equal to negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, x of t, y of t, z of t, and x0, zero, y0, zero, z0 zero is equal to negative 2, 1, 1. Okay, so it's just a really complicated way of saying solve the system of differential equations given this initial value condition that we have. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we just take this matrix and we got to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So determinant of this guy, well, negative 1 minus lambda, negative 1, negative 2, 1, 1 minus lambda, 1, 0, 0 minus lambda. Okay. There's actually a way of solving this problem by uh, using the trace and the product, uh, the trace of the determinant method. Yeah. Uh, is it negative 1 minus lambda, negative 2, negative 2? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so you can actually, like, you can actually just look at this matrix. You can, like, use the whole... Um, uh, what was it? what what was I gonna say? The trace of the matrix and the nullity of the matrix can get you like eigenvalues and what for. Um, but we can just solve it this way. Um, we'll expand along this guy on the bottom. It's because there's a row of zeros down there, so that's negative lambda to the or negative lambda times negative one to the three plus three, and then that's equal to and then times the determinant 
negative 1 minus lambda, negative 2, 1, 1 minus lambda. All right, we've seen this. This is negative lambda, lambda squared, plus lambda, minus lambda, minus 1 plus 2, which is negative lambda times lambda squared plus 1. And that's good enough for us to get all our eigenvalues. Okay, so lambda is 0, and then plus or minus i. So I don't think I don't think in this previous midterm we got a we got a complex value system, right? That didn't show up. And that's a this is a good this is a good candidate to show up on the final. Okay, so how do we deal with complex value systems? Remember, we want to deal with the the, the real guy first because it's easy to deal with. So um, you get lambda equals zero. Uh, so you just get the same matrix again, A. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. And we can find the first eigenvector for this guy. Anyone? 0, 1, negative 1. OK. So that's just the first matrix. And now we've got lambda equals i. So remember, with the complex valued, with the complex valued eigenvalues, we only need to do with like we only deal with like one of the eigenvalues, right? Because you have this whole like foiling stuff at the end to get to get all our solutions. So we'll only deal with lambda equals i first. Um, and what you get a minus i i is equal to negative one minus i negative two negative two one one minus i one. 0, 0, negative i. And so now we'll get some eigenvector. OK, so this eigenvector isn't easy to eyeball at all. But one of the entries should be pretty, pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah, 0 for the third, third guy. Yeah, because, I mean, you have this row here that needs to get killed off. And you can only use 0 to do it, so we put our 0 there. OK, so that's 0. So what does that mean? That means we kind of we, we can ignore the third column. We only really need to look at like the first two columns now. Um, and right here, we have a 1 and we have a 1 minus i. So what I can do is I can make this guy 1 minus i, and then this guy negative 1. Because I know for a fact that 1 times 1 minus i, and then here you get 1 minus i times negative 1, they're going to cancel each other out. And what's left, then I have to check that negative 1 minus i times 1 minus i plus negative 2 times negative 1. So I'm essentially doing this. Right, so I'm essentially multiplying those two guys. Uh, I need this to be zero, and what happens? This is negative one plus i squared minus i plus i my, uh, plus two. So this is negative one minus one plus two. That's zero. Yeah, that is zero. So it's fine. Okay. Any questions with the uh, eigenvector there? So this one was it's actually not, a, not an easy eigenvector to find. All right, so what do you do now? Well, we can begin writing the general solution, x of t. Um, eh, x of t. Uh, and what's the first thing you can write? Well, we can write out this lambda equals 0 case. Um, so you get c1 e to the 0 t times 0, 1, negative 1. All right, so that's going to be fine. That's going to be there. But now I have to deal with this whole thing with the lambda equals i 
and that complex value eigenvalue. So what happens is, right, you get temporarily, you get some constant e to the i t times 1 minus i negative 1, 0. And we need to figure out what the heck this is. Right. So, I mean, you have that lambda, and then you have this eigenvector, and you just plug them in. But this isn't, this isn't technically correct. So what we need to do is the following. So this guy, c e to the i t times 1 minus i negative 1, 0. That's really equal to, all right, it's equal to, well, we can actually just drop the c for now. Um, it's sine t or cosine t plus i sine t all right multiplied by and now we need to split up this eigenvector into the real and imaginary parts so the real part is 1 negative 1 0 and then you add i times negative 1 0 0 Do we remember this? The same, a little familiar? Okay, so now we have to foil it uh, and get the real and imaginary part. So foiling, I get cosine t, 1, negative 1, 0. Okay, and then outer uh, is plus i cosine t, negative 1, 0, 0. Uh, inner plus i sine t 1 negative 1 0 plus last or so this becomes uh, so it becomes plus i squared sine t negative 1 0 0 but we need to realize that i squared is just equal to negative 1 okay so what do we really get well now you need to group Right, you need to group the real terms and you need to group the imaginary terms. So here you get cosine t, one negative one zero, and then here you have this minus sine t negative one zero zero. Okay, so that's grouping these two. And then you have plus i, and you got the <coughs> sine t one negative one zero plus cosine t negative one zero zero. And so I just group those real and imaginary terms in. And now I have my solutions, right? This is a solution here, and this guy in the parentheses is a solution as well. Okay, so going back up. Um, so this needs to get erased because that's not what we want. And what we want instead is we want plus C2 times I guess the first guy, cosine 1, negative 1, 0, plus sine negative 1, 0, 0, or that's a minus sign, right? And I'm missing my t's. And then what else? And now you get plus c3 sine t 1 negative 1 0 plus cosine t negative 1 0 0 okay so this is the general solution <clears throat> and it'd be nice just to stop here but you have the particular solution you need to find yeah Do you need the I no you can't uh, which is why uh, this part is only in the brackets and it's because your original your original matrix doesn't have any like imaginary terms in it. So, yeah. When, when do you drop the I mean, you drop it here, right? We don't we don't bring it up here. No, I know, but I mean, like, when do you drop that as a solution? That That's oh, you drop the so so you either so in the not systems, but like just the differential equation by itself. Right, the right hand side being sine or cosine determines if you take the imaginary solution or you drop the imaginary solution. But that's that's different from here.
Yeah. No, because uh, that's the whole point is that this one eigenvalue, um, for complex eigenvalues, this is enough because this whole part of dropping the imaginary term is essentially taking another eigenvalue. Okay, and it's because uh, with eigen with complex eigenvalues, you get the whole you get the whole symmetric thing, right? Where for lambda equals negative i, we actually we don't actually have to calculate anything because its eigenvector for lambda equals negative i is just one plus i negative one and zero. You just flip that sign. So there's no point in calculating it because down here um, we actually take that into account when we. Uh, when you like do this factoring and you drop the i down here, you you, you don't need to f deal with the other eigenvalue. Okay. Is that for every case you just don't have to deal with the? Yeah, with case? systems you, just, you you never have to deal with the eigenvalue because because what are we trying to find? Right? We're trying to find three linearly independent solutions, right? And we have three linearly independent solutions, right? Without ever resorting to the other eigenvalue. So I mean, one thing you could do is like. You could go down here, and you can just drop this guy, right? And then you can just go to the other eigenvalue and do the same thing over, and take the real part from that eigenvalue. But then you're just you're just doing extra work. So that's why we just take that the other, the other part. Okay. So now we have to deal with the initial value condition. Uh, it's actually kind of annoying. So uh, you got. So if you let if you let x at zero, so this is really the vector x t at zero. What's that really equal to? Um, you get okay, so you get c one zero negative one one. That's fine. Plus c two, and then the cosine t is the only thing that's going to have anything at t equals zero. Right, because sine of zero is zero. So we don't we don't care about the sine term. So there's just C two times one negative one zero and then plus C three, but we only care about the cosine term again. So that's C three negative one zero zero. And this is equal to um, whatever initial value condition we had. Negative two one one. So this is just a system of equations where if we take these columns over here, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, um, we can just augment it with 2, 1, 1, and we can just solve for the system. And really, here, this tells me that C1 is equal to 1. And then we should be 0, 1, 1. Yeah, I did something wrong. Where is 0, 1, negative 1? Oh, it's here. There we go. OK. So C1 equals negative 1. Uh, that makes C2 equal to negative 2. And then that makes C3 0. And then you got to plug this back into your original solution, whatever, for the. OK, any questions? All right, that's number eight. I think, I think there's a good chance you're going to get one of these on the final. You know, it's always exciting to see like, how much of the final I can predict each year. I don't think I do. I, I do around like 60%, which is like decent. Um, OK, so number nine. Is what? Okay, this. Oh, this is a good problem. Suppose that A is an unknown three by three matrix uh, in in the complex numbers, but it doesn't really matter. And X Y Z are complex numbers. Uh, 
uh, which satisfy A times 2, 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1 equals 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, x, y, z. Okay. Okay, part A just says find two complex numbers. A and B such that A times 2, 1, 2 plus B times 1, 0, 1 is equal to 1, 2, 1. And this is supposed to be an A. Okay. I mean, this this isn't hard. You can either eyeball it or you can like set this system up. So the first row and the second row, uh, first row and third row kill each other. One zero two. So here you can see that a is equal to two and b is equal to negative three. about that okay uh, the second part of this problem is is, is the good part um, find XYZ using a above using part a so how do we find that last column given that we have no idea what A is, right? but we know part A. Okay, so find x, y, z given part A. And it is. Honestly, I stood there, I sat there, I was like, damn, I don't know how to do this problem. <coughs> like, when I saw it. it. Took a while. I have a question. Yeah. Why is it asking for complex numbers? Like, Why complex? It's because the professor is really extra, and he likes to scare kids. But it's, it's, okay. it's, it's just that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's immediately clear to me who wrote this problem last year. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> this problem and the next problem. <laughs> and it is, yeah. Like, 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 what do you mean? Like, once you multiply <coughs> A times this guy, you get like this guy. So A is kind of right? Yeah. So you're have A1, A1, oh, so you're you're saying like you're saying like do this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that, that, that's too much work. <laughs> Any ideas? All right. You got an idea? No. Okay. So let me just spoil it. Um, so this is where I, re I distinctly remember talking about this at the, at the beginning of the semester where I was like, all right, we have a matrix and you multiply by the first column of another matrix. What do you get? You get the first column, right? So if you take a matrix, Take A, 
and I multiply by this column, I'll get the first column back. Okay. So what does that mean? So if I call this column V1 and this column W1, right, I know that A V1 is equal to W1. All right, that's always the case. That's, that's always, always, always the case. That's just how matrix multiplication works. All right, so likewise, I know that A V2 is going to be W2. All right, but what's that vector? What's that vector? Is it V3? Yeah, I can call it V3, but what did we just do in part A? It's 2V1 minus Yeah, it's 2V1 minus, V2, or minus 3V2. So now what's A times 2V1 minus 3V2? Well, matrix multiplication, it's a linear transformation. So it just distributes. All right. Well, we said AV1 is W1. And we said that V2, AV2 is W2. There you go. So now we just need to find W1, W2. This is 2 times 2, 1, 1, <coughs> minus 3 times 1, 2, 1. All right, and so that should get you, what is this, 4, 2, 2, minus 3, 6, 3. So that's 1, negative 4, negative 1. Make sense? Again, one of those problems where you have to like see it once and then you'll you'll remember it. Uh, I think this is one of those non-traditional problems. This is number two of four. Any questions? Third column is two v one minus three v two. No, like you just did it. It's just like it's just XYZ. Yeah, and then the problem for part B was to find XYZ. Any other questions? Okay. Number nine. Uh, number ten. Number ten. This is actually going to take us two and a half hours. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, so number ten. What the professor did was he gave you an essentially a reduction of order problem and then made you do it step by step. So the directions are super unclear and they're super vague and they're really confusing. So a lot of you just didn't know how to do this because they just couldn't decipher what he wanted like from the wording. The problem is really just solve the frickin' diffy cube which takes up this entire page, but it, it's just solve the Diffie Q, except instead of making solve the Diffie Q 15 points or 10 points, uh, it's two really vague steps that no one really knew how to do, and then five extra credit points. All right, so let's just do the, let's just do the part that's actually relevant, <laughs> which is solve the damn Diffie Q. It says find a particular solution, but let's just solve this guy. Um, it's x, y double prime, minus 2x minus, plus 1, y prime, plus x plus 2, y is equal to x cubed, e to the 2x. And you have that. Yeah. What are the directions, guys? Yeah, let, let, let's read it. Um, okay. 
part a, okay, the function y1x equals e to the x satisfies the differential equation, that stuff equals 0. So part a asks you to write down a differential equation for a function u of x so that u of x satisfies this differential equation, then the function y p of x is equal to u of x y1 of x, which essentially just says guess u1 of y of x. And then that satisfies the differential equation that got on the board. Okay? And then that's it. So essentially, he wanted you to write down a function for <coughs> u of x. Okay, so, so, what, so what part A wanted you to do was do the reduction of order down to the point where you have like u double prime plus u prime is equal to the right hand side. That's, that's what that part A meant. All right, so it's like, so like it, was, it was reduction order step by step. So the first part was guess y is equal to u times y1, and then plug that into the differential equation, and then get down to the u, just, the, just the first order differential equation in u. And then the second part says, fine, yeah, whatever. It's a mess, it's a mess. Um, so let's just solve this, um, because you're not going to have a part by part reduction of order problem, I, I, I promise you. So, um, okay, so solve this thing. So this is why one is equal to e of x. Okay, so y is gonna be u of x, y one of x. Oh, if you can't tell, we're using reduction of order. Um, I mean, some clues, non-constant coefficients. All right, there's your clue. Um, so, okay, that's y is equal to u of x, y1 of x, and now what? Okay, so y prime, oh, and that's really u of x, e to the x. So y prime is going to be u of x, e to the x, plus u prime of x, e to the x, and y double prime is going to be u of x, e to the x, plus 2u prime of x, e to the x, plus u double prime e to the x. All right, product rule <coughs> for the derivatives. Okay, now I want to plug in. <coughs> so remember the reduction order shortcut, which was drop the u terms. So you have x times y double prime so we like ignore this guy, uh, and then this is two u prime e to the x. I'm dropping the parentheses of x's now, plus u double prime, and now you have minus two x plus one y prime. So again, we ignore that guy, and this is then just u prime e to the x, and then we ignore the whole y term, right? We just don't care about that y term. And so this is equal to x cubed e to the 2x. All right, look familiar? Or this, that, these process, this process should be familiar. OK, so we need to simplify. Um, what do we get? Uh, here you get 2x u prime e to the x plus u double prime x. Oh, I'm missing an e to the x here, whoops. So u double prime x, e to the x. And then minus, uh, distribute, this is 2x u prime e to the x minus 2u prime e to the x. So that's x cubed e to the 2x. Okay. Now what? Uh, this guy and this guy cancel. So you're left with u double prime x e to the x minus 2u prime e to the x is equal to x cubed e to the 2x. Okay. Okay. Um,
All right, so what do we do now? Well, we would really like to uh, use the integration factor, but what's the one rule on the integration factor that we haven't satisfied? Yeah, the thingy in front of the u double prime has to be one. So we gotta divide this entire thing by x e the x. <laughs> So really, we have u double prime minus 2 over x u prime is equal to, uh, this becomes x squared e to the x. All right, so the e to the 2x, e to the x cancels the 2 or 1 of the e to the x's, and then x cancels the 1 of the x cubes. OK, so now we do the integration factor here, the int factor. which is e to the integral of what? <coughs> negative 2 over x. All right, so don't forget the negative sign out in front. All right, so what is this? This is really e to the negative 2 ln x. And now you have to play around with this a little more. This is e to the ln x to the negative 2. All right, by the... By the logarithm rules. So now the e and the ln, finally, they cancel each other. So that's really uh, x to the negative 2. So what do you do now? You multiply the entire thing through by the integration factor. Um, or, so I'm going to do that. You can use the shortcut. So if you multiply the entire thing through, you get this 2 x to the negative 3 is equal to e to the x. And then this side is equal to d dx of u prime times int factor. Right, that's always the case. But the left hand side, after you multiply through by the integration factor, is equal to the derivative of u prime times the int factor. So this is d dx of u prime times the int factor, which is x negative 2. And so that's equal to e to the x. Okay, so when you go from when you go from here to here, uh, you need to be really careful. This 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 is where a lot of the integration factor stuff like mistakes come. Uh, some people forget to multiply the int factor on the right hand side. You need to do that. Um, just keep that in mind. Okay, yeah, so you can honestly, like this step right here is optional. This is an optional step to write out. You can go from here to here if you're comfortable with doing that. That's, I mean, we're not looking for that middle step. Okay, so now what? Now we can integrate. So let's bring in the integrals. So this integral just gets rid of that ddx. This is u prime times x to the negative 2, which is equal to e to the x plus c. It's called c1. All right, now we need to get, well now we want to just isolate u so we can integrate. So we multiply the entire thing on both sides by x squared, or we divide by x to the negative two, your choice. So you get u prime is equal to x squared e to the x plus c1 x squared. And then this is where I like, forgot if I told my students to put x squared e to the x, the integral of that on their cheat sheet. Uh, I guess. I mean, what else? There's a bunch on there already. Like x ln x integral of like ln x, integral of x ln x, integral of x squared ln x. Um, one of which would, which would have saved your ass on the last midterm. Um, I forget which one. And then now you got like, integral of x e to the x and the integral of x squared e to the x, I guess. That's about it. Okay. Or you can do this by parts. Um, I personally did it by Wolfram Alpha, which you won't have for the exam. So uh, what is this? This is u is equal to this guy is e to the x, x squared minus 2x plus 2. And this is plus 
C1 x cubed over 3 plus C2. Okay, and then finally, y1 or y of x is equal to y1 times u. So that's e to the x times e to the x x squared minus 2x plus 2 plus c1 x cubed over 3 plus c2. All right, here's one thing that I didn't really talk about um, that I didn't do here. Uh, the c1 eats that 3 in the denominator, right? Just by, because c one's an unknown coefficient, so it just eats the three. Um, so if we write this out, this is x squared e to the two x minus two x e to the two x plus two e to the two x, all right? And then plus c one e to the x x cubed, or c one x cubed e to the x, let's write it that way. Okay, so there's the C1 eating that fraction, and then plus C2 e to the x. All right, very standard reduction of order type differential equation. Um, also really likely for everything. Yeah. Do you think a reduction of order when we're not given the, like... Yeah, so it happened in your midterm, right? We had like the Koshi Orla, or assuming you're in Dobby's class, you had like the Koshi Orla homogeneous that he made you solve by hand, and then you have to do the reduction order. So, uh, in the case you're not given a solution, you need to solve for the homogeneous or a homogeneous solution, and then you can use reductive order on the homogeneous solution. Yeah? Uh, did we do that fraction killing thing? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so this thing, because 3 is a constant, it gets eaten by the constant. Yeah. If that were like an x, or if that were like ln y or something on the bottom, you would leave it. Right? Okay, any other questions? All right, last problem. I don't even know how much of this last problem we're going to do. Um,. Number 11, let A be the five by five matrix. All right, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 six, three, zero, 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 two, uh, negative two, one. All right. Note that A is composed of a three by three and a two by two matrix put along the diagonal. Find A to the 40. Yeah. The four, the four, four cell is six or zero. That's a six. Yeah. Yeah. So, which one? Yeah, that's a six. This this guy's a six. This the second try. So. Okay. Everything else is zero. That looks like a zero. Um, all right. So how do we how do we find a to the forty? Well, we want to diagonalize it, but we can't. So so just diagonalizing this entire five by five is kind of a pain, um, and you can't do it. So uh, the reason why they said that note that a is composed of a like two blocks on a diagonal is because you can. Do each block separately. So that can only happen when you have something like this. When you have a block, and you have a block, and if it's on the diagonal, we can just deal with each block independently. 
All right, so if we look at block one, <coughs> which is one one zero zero one one zero zero one. All right, we want to raise this to the fortieth. Right. Is this defective or non-defective? It's defective. Can anyone see why just immediately? Yeah, it's a Jordan block. It's a Jordan block. It's just straight up a Jordan block, right? You have the one above the diagonal, and you got, a, you got like whatever on the diagonal. Right? You got the same values on the diagonal. This is a Jordan block, it's defective. I mean, we're gonna do it out. Um, Lambda is equal to one with multiplicity three, right? Just because it's ones on the diagonal, right? So one, 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 that means it's one with multiplicity three. So a minus one i, or just a minus i, that's zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. This is rank two, nullity one, Okay, so it's rank two nullity one. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, it, it means that it's defective, right? One is less than three, defective. So this is nullity. This is multiplicity. So it's defective. So what do we do? Uh, we square it and whatever. So so this is actually like. It's kind of unnecessary, but I'm going to do it anyways. When you have a Jordan block, the Jordan block's just going to be... When you have a Jordan block, S matrix is the identity matrix. The Jordan block is the Jordan block, right? Because it's S, J, S inverse. So if you're already given a Jordan matrix, you just put the Jordan matrix in the middle and you put the identity on both sides. But we'll, we'll solve for it explicitly here. So, okay, so nullity one, right? There's less than multiplicity three. What does the nullity tell me about a Jordan block or the Jordan matrix in the middle? Can you define a Jordan matrix? What makes it that? Uh, <laughs> recitation 14. But you, it, it's, it's essentially when you have a one on the off diagonal. Just like above both. Yeah, above, above your eigenvalues. OK. So, so what, does, what does nullity one tell me? There's one Jordan block, right? So if I write SJS inverse, here's J. What's what's on the diagonal of J? The eigenvalue, right? So in this case, it's just one, right? Three times. Where is it? Right here. Okay. So one, 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 and then um, so there's only one block. Uh. Okay, so there's only one block, which means that I have to fill in that block with my with the ones. So there's my Jordan block. So now there's S and there's S inverse. Okay. So now I have A minus I. What power do I need to raise A minus I to? Three, why three? Yeah, that's the size of the Jordan block. Okay, so this Jordan block is three by three, so I need to cube it. So A minus, lamp, A minus I squared is this guy, right? One in the top right, and then A minus I cubed is gonna be the zero matrix. Yeah. Is the like highest power that you do is going to be zero matrix or not? No, 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 not necessarily. Again, watch roughly fourteen. Okay. Especially for a three by three, that's not obvious. All right. So now what? Right. So now we need to choose VG, choose our generalized eigenvector, such that a minus i cubed VG is zero. 
But a minus i squared vg is non-zero, and a minus i times the generalized eigenvector is non-zero. OK? So what? there's actually only one choice of a generalized eigenvector I can make here. What is it? 0, 0, 1, right? Because otherwise, because this guy has to be non-zero. So okay, VG is 0, 0, 1. A minus lambda I squared VG is 1, 0, 0. And then a minus lambda i v g ends up being 0, 1, 0. Okay, and then if you remember, how do we put these into the S matrix? Um, here you put a minus lambda i squared v g, and then you put a minus lambda i v g, and then you put v g. So in the S matrix, we put the highest power guy first, 1, 0, 0. Then a minus lambda i vg, 0, 1, 0. And then vg is 0, 0, 1. Okay, well, this is an easy matrix to invert because it's just the identity matrix. Okay, so what does this tell me? This kind of tells me that if I want to find this guy to the 40th power, I just take the original matrix and I just raise it to the 40th power. There's really no way around it, right? Because what happens is this guy to the 40th, I don't know, we need to call this block a name. Let's call this B, right? So B to the 40th is equal to S, J to the 40th, S inverse. But J is literally B. It's the same guy. So we actually kind of just have to bash out what j to the 40th is, and you actually had to do that on this final. Um, it ends up being like combinatorics. There's like some binomial factor, is it like something 40 choose something that you could have done? Um, anyway, it's not the best. And then likewise, block two on the bottom, I think this one was more doable. This is six, three, negative two, one. So this uh, is equal to six minus, uh, so what is it? Six minus lambda, one minus lambda. I'll call this block like B2, three, negative two. And then you take the determinant, lambda squared, minus seven lambda, plus six, plus, plus six. This is lambda squared minus seven lambda plus 12. So this is lambda minus three, lambda minus four. So at least this one's doable. Um, so lambda equals three, you get a minus three i, which is three, three, negative two, negative two. So we choose v1 as one, negative one. And the lambda equals four, we get two, three, negative two, negative three, which then V2, let's say it's three, negative two. Okay, so that means B2 to the 40th. Is equal to one, negative one, three, negative two times three, four, and then that guy inverse, whatever S is here inverse, we're not going to do it because we're out of time. But now we just raise that middle matrix to the 40th power. And then your final answer is going to be like this guy to the 40th in this top three by three. And then the bottom, you'll have B2 to the 40th, whatever that answer is. Um, not a super constructive problem, but at least we went through the, like, going through the Jordan Tanakh form thing. Yeah. Is it decent to have, like, 3004 to the 40th? Like, 
I mean, no, so so this isn't bad, because this you can actually just write out. You can just leave it as 3 to the 40th times 4 to the 40th. Oh, so you didn't have to yeah, you didn't have to do that one. But, so it's like, that's like fine, because then you can like multiply around it, right? Um, here, up here, you kind of had to bash out, like you had to go like full 6160 and like find the combinations for that guy. So it's it's not the best. So, anyways, that's it. Good luck. On Wednesday, I'll have office hours tomorrow. I'll send out emails. Um, again, survey if you haven't fi uh, filled it out. I really appreciate that. And exams are up here if you still have them. Um, good luck. I'll be on Piazza really actively tomorrow, starting in the afternoon, and all that stuff. So again, I'll send out an email. Yeah. <laughs> oh